Hello and thank you for coming to our talk today on detecting plastics in coastal waters with Sentinel satellite data and machine learning. My name is Stuart Lin. I'm a data scientist and engineer with the data clinic at Two Sigma. Two Sigma, for those of you who don't know, is a financial services organization. We're most well known for our hedge fund, but we offer a range of different services. And we're a little bit atypical for a financial services organization in that we uh, have most of our employees are actually um, data scientists and engineers. Another thing that makes us a little bit different is the fact that we have the data clinic, which is what I'm part of. Um, and the data clinic is a volunteer um, created initiative um, at Two Sigma um, that models itself after a legal clinic and that we provide pro bono data science and engineering support to nonprofits, government agencies, and academic institutions. The way we do this is we scope out projects with these partners um, that will really impact their communities through data and engineering. And then we create volunteer teams um, staffed by two segment employees to help those partners out. We also conduct self-driven research and produce open source tooling that contributes to the data for good movement. And some of that self-driven research is what you're gonna hear about today. In the past, we've worked with people like the Environmental Defense Fund, the Vera Institute for Justice, Robin Hood, um, and a whole bunch of other um, organizations. We're sector agnostics, so we kind of work with anybody and everybody. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about work we've been doing over the past eight months with the Plymouth Marine Lab um, and this plastic detection project. Um, they had already done a lot of work before we got in touch with them um, and had created some really interesting uh, models and some really interesting findings. And so I'm going to hand over to Lauren from PML to really talk through um, the work that they did um, before we got in contact with them. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Beerman. I work at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK, and for about the last 18 months or so, I've been working with my colleagues to look for plastic patches in coastal waters using optical data collected by the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 satellites. Now, there are some key terms here. The first is the word macroplastics. Um, I'm talking about plastics that you can hold in your hand, like macroplastic litter, things that are bigger than um, five millimeters, um, but Essentially, I'm talking about like the wrapper from your lunch today or your coffee cup. Um, and I'm also talking specifically about coastal waters. That's where pollution sort of enters from the land, but it's also where Sentinel-2 collects the data. Now, plastic entering the coastal zone, if it's not recirculated onto beaches, if it doesn't sink or get removed through cleanup operations, then the plastic will enter the open ocean where it's free to do all sorts of nefarious things, like become ingested or entangled and inevitably degrade into microplastics. Now, theoretically, we've known for a while that satellites should be able to detect floating macroplastics. Um, what's exciting is that myself and my group are the first to, to actually prove that, to demonstrate it. That's because we've had access to Sentinel-2 data. Uh, the European Space Agency operates these satellites. They were launched in 2015 and, seven, and 2017. They're primarily terrestrial satellites, but coverage does include coastal waters every two to five days. And the resolution is so good that you can detect small things floating in the coastal environment, like boats, and in this case, patches of floating debris. So all that's limiting you is things like cloud cover and wave caps, so wind. And you're completely reliant on sub scale features to gather the materials into a patch. And you're also, I guess, uh, you, you need to really like... Um, looking for needles in a haystack, because that's pretty much what I do. Uh, this is a really good video demonstrating what I do. So what you can see here is a front. So this is a front diagonally across the screen, and it's gathered those materials. Um, we've got um, the water itself, we've got some, some plant debris, and we've got the bright white objects, which are the plastics. And if we imagine that our swimmer in the scenario is about six, foot in fins, then that's about the size of a Sentinel-2 pixel. And you've got three sort of confounding factors here. You've got the plastic, you've got the plant material and the water. And in order to distinguish between those things, you can leverage the you can leverage Sentinel-2's bands, um, particularly the near infrared. So um, if you want to tell the difference between plant material, water and, and plastic debris, then being able to utilize the near infrared and the shortwave infrared bands become quite key. So we use a floating debris index and a normalized uh, vegetation index, and both of those are reliant on a strong signal in the near infrared. The problem is that a lot of atmospheric corrections for marine applications actually remove the near infrared to short uh, wave infrared signals, um, which makes it impossible, but you have to do an atmospheric correction, or it's, it's certainly more responsible to do an atmospheric correction. 
We were fortunate in that we um, had Acolyte. Uh, that's a processor that is designed for Sentinel-2 and Landsat. It conserves the near-infrared shore of infrared wavelengths. It, it uses a dark spectrum fitting algorithm, uh, which allows us to then use our floating degree index and a normalized uh, vegetation index. And again, as I said, all you need to know there is it leverages the heck out of the near infrared and allows for subpixel detection. What that means really is that even if uh, debris doesn't fit uh, or doesn't fill a 10 by 10 meter pixel, that's okay because what we've seen from previous work is that if, the, if it's plastic bottles, for example, then if 30% of the pixel is filled, like we're golden. If it's things like fishing nets and plastic bags, you need to have more of a proportion filling the pixel and as long as you have about 50% filling the pixel, then you're going to have um, an accurate detection from Sentinel-2. So that's what I mean about Sentinel-2 subpixel detection. Now, using um, those pixels from, from the targets that you saw, we, we had an, about nine pixels. We were able to create a spectral signature of what plastic looks like, floating plastic, including the water signal. Um, and then we went out and we looked for all sorts of things that float in the marine environment because we know that plastics are going to be mixed with things like plant material and other debris. And we created this library of spectral signatures so that we could tell manually by looking per pixel what was dominating that pixel. And from that point on, the idea was to then build a machine learning algorithm that could classify those materials in an automated way. But it doesn't really matter how forgiving your machine learning algorithm is. If you've got nine pixels of plastics, you're not going anywhere. Uh, we then, um, luckily, that's a weird word to say, but there was a flood in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa uh, in April 2019. I had some wonderful colleagues, uh, Grant and Janine, who were taking photos and sharing those photos with me to show the amount of plastic debris. And they gave me very detailed information about when the harbor that was choked with plastic, uh, when it recirculated out and all of that debris was moved into the open ocean. And I was able to, on that day, get 50 pixels of plastics being washed out into the open ocean. So there we had our validated plastics. And if we plot those in two variable feature space again, of NDVI versus the FDI, you actually get some really neat clustering, which means that um, we've got some, some good sort of distinct groups for machine learning training. We picked a naive Bayes classifier. Um, it's quite forgiving. Even 50 pixels is quite small in the machine learning world, but um, it assumes that predictors and features are independent. We used FDI and NDVI values and some remote sensing bands uh, to compute the probability of a pixel belonging to each of the classes. And we trained it with everything that I've shown you previously up to this point. And then in order to test it, we went out into the world and we looked for plastic. So I looked on social media, I looked in uh, the published literature, and in red over here, you can see all of the places that made it into the paper that was published um, just a few weeks ago in Nature Scientific Reports. Uh, so there are lots of examples. I've got one of Vietnam, and obviously you know about Durban. There's one of Ghana, Scotland, and Canada. But I studied in Scotland, and so I'm biased, and I'm going to use that one as the example for you. Um, we know plastic pollution has been getting worse in Scottish, on Scottish beaches. A colleague of mine shared this incredible picture of, um, of a seal, seal pup hauled out amongst loads of plastic bottles and a, and a soccer ball. Um, it's not that Scottish people are litterbugs. Actually, the North Sea tends to drift a lot of that debris onto the east coast of the UK. And um, what it looks like when you spot it, in the RGB it doesn't look like anything, but what we have here is that front, so that aggregating feature, that's the Isle of May on the east coast of Scotland. And on the right-hand side is what happens when you apply the FDI, the floating debris index, and you start to see, thanks to this near-infrared leveraging, the, 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 the stuff that's floating along, along that front. Um, we, we then fed all of the detections from Ghana and Scotland and Vietnam and um, Canada into our naive base classifier. It ranged, so we manually said, this is what we suspect to be plastic, and the classifier said, yeah, well, I agree, this is plastic, about 86% of the time. So that ranged from about 75% um, at the worst to about 100% agreement at the best. That was in Canada, because I think we had a lot of polystyrene. But basically, things that weren't, um, so if you look at this confusion matrix, what you can see is that, um, the, you know, it's trained with water and it sees water 100% of the time. It's trained with seaweed and it detected seaweed 100% of the time. When it came to plastics, uh, you know, sort of 3% of the time it said, I think this is water, so potentially the pixel wasn't sufficiently filled with debris. Or it said, I think this is foam, 
uh, which is which is fair enough. There's a lot of seafoam mixed in with these sorts of aggregations. So in conclusion, um, we cracked it. This is great. It was technically very interesting for us, and we're delighted to to sort of be able to publish that we've done such a thing. But in order to take it forward, the thing that's really holding us back is the atmospheric correction. Um, we need to do more on that. And one of the things I've been interested in doing is perhaps looking at a more normalization approach to the atmospheric correction instead of um, a more traditional atmospheric correction. And that's where I met up with Stephen and with um, Stuart in order to try and crack this next stage of the problem. But I'll, I'll let you take on, I'll, I'll let them take on from here. Thanks, Lauren, for that really great summary of the work that you guys did. Um, we originally learned of the work that PNL was doing um, from a BBC News article, and we were thrilled to be able to reach out to them and offer our services as a way of providing extra capacity to the work they were doing. Um, as Laura mentioned, the uh, work was kind of really in a proof of concept phase when we um, started talking to them. Um, and what we you know, originally planned to do was help them scale up this analysis um, to make it much more robust, to make it um, easily deployable in different scenes and different time ranges. And the way we wanted to do that was using um, the Python ecosystem, and in particular, the EOLearn um, package. Um, EOLearn is a, a package that was released by um, Sentinel Hub to kind of really provide the connected tissue between satellite imagery and machine learning workflows. It defines a common standard for storing data in a way that's amenable to machine learning. And also gives us the ability to create these various like, uh, individualized parts of an analysis that can be swapped in and out of composable workflows that make it really easy to kind of create very complex um, uh, image processing pipelines um, really quite simply. One of the best um, advantages of using it um, is that it allows us to take a large scene like this in Scotland and subdivide that region into much smaller areas, um, all with overlapping pixels that allow us to like, perform our analysis on much smaller units. This is desirable in two ways. Firstly, it allows us to kind of very easily parallelize this work so it can be scaled up to, to cover large areas. And it also means that there is way less um, resource um, issues of trying to load in huge scenes into memory. EOLearn itself gives us kind of three abstractions to work with. There are EO patches, which are standard containers for uh, data over a given geographic area and a given time range. They can store raster data, vector data, and any associated metadata. Um, and then these patches are operated on by EO tasks. So an EO task will um, receive an EO patch. It will access the data that's on that EO patch, um, do some calculations, and either add new features, update the existing features on the patch, or do some kind of general transformation of that EO patch. And then our analysis basically consists then of multiple EEO tasks um, that are arranged in a workflow that can be executed one after each other to, to perform the full analysis that we're interested in. In Python um, code, like as a Python object, this is what an EO patch looks like. You can see there's lots of really useful information on here. Um, so we've got this kind of context information, which tells us the bounding um, region of the patch and the timestamp over which we have data um, for the patch. And then the meat of the patch is in the data um, uh, property, which contains um, multiple different um, data products, um, some coming from the Sentinel satellite imagery directly. Others are ones that we calculate along the way using other EO tasks that can be appended onto the EO patch for use down, further down the pipeline. And then finally, we also have this um, mask property, which allows us to store masks um, that can be really useful in selecting what pixels we do and don't want to use in different parts of the analysis. So for example, a mask could tell us whether or not there's valid data from the satellite in a given pixel, whether that pixel is actually cloud cover um, or you know, any other kind of selection like that. Out of the box, EO Learn gives us a bunch of different tasks that we can use um, just without having to write them ourselves. Um, these are really useful and a great time saver. So for example, there are tasks to gather the different Sentinel bands, um, both the LC1 and L2A level Sentinel bands, um, and also to create common indexes like the Normalized um, Difference Vegetation Index or the Normalized Difference Water Index, um, and then some like other really useful um, tasks like the cloud cover prediction. Um, so these are pre-trained models that Sentinel Hub has released to um, do uh, cloud cover detection, which is again, really useful in masking these out um, and like pre-trained pixel models. Um, so there's a lot here that you can just use out of the box and means you don't have to like, reinvent the wheel, which is great. Of course, part of the analysis is gonna require custom code 
And EOTask makes that really easy to um, generate as well. So here we just create a class called Calculate FDI, which is the floating debris index Lauren was talking about earlier, which is kind of pivotal to our analysis. And the way we can implement that is just by subclassing the EOTask class and then implementing this execute method. The execute method will be passed the EO patch from the previous step in the pipeline, along with um, uh, parameters that can be defined at runtime. And then it can grab the data from that EO patch. So here we're grabbing three different bands from the, the original Sentinel satellite imagery. We perform our calculation for the FDI itself. And then we add that onto the patch um, with the label of FDI for further use down the pipeline. So when we come to the machine learning stage, for example, we have access to that property there on the EO patch. So this is a really great way of um, basically uh, creating a like unit of analysis that we can compose into wider workflows. And then defining a workflow itself is pretty simple. We just list the tasks that we want to have the workflow perform. And then we call this execute function with the parameters we want to pass into each one of those tasks. So for example, here, we're passing into the input task, the bounding region that we're interested in grabbing from the Sentinel satellite imagery, and the time range over which we want to analyze that data. We're also passing parameters here into the combined mass task and the local norm task. Once the workflow is run, we receive back the EO patch, which we can save out um, for you know, use in the later analysis, or just grab the data from that to, to you know, um, do whatever we want with. And so using these tools, um, it was really you know, easy and really efficient to be able to translate what um, uh, Plymouth had done into this like, really reusable workflow. Um, and that led us to start then applying it to very large scenes um, uh, from Sentinel. So for example, there's this region of Scotland here, the one I showed before um, and the, the um, other map, where we're able to take the um, Plymouth Moon Lab model and use it to predict the classifications for each pixel within this scene. Um, when we started doing that for these larger scenes, we started noticing some issues um, with the, this approach. Um, the first being that you know the model here correctly identifies many of the pixels here as water, but around the coastal region of Scotland here, where the water is a slightly different hue, there's a slightly different water quality, it's misclassifying the water as um, sputum. And our hypothesis for why this is, is because of the limited nature of our training data for the model. Um, as Lauren alluded to, um, this data is still really hard to collect and really hard to build up a large catalog um, of. Um, we only have very few number of confirmed um, pixels um, of actual debris and plastic in the ocean. And a lot of these come from very similar images, very similar scenes. Um, you know, many of them come from the same satellite imagery pass. This means that the water quality and the atmospheric quality, um, which affects the, the spectra and therefore the floating debris index and NDVI, um, are kind of baked into the model to some extent. And it means that the model struggles a little bit to um, generalize to new scenes like we can see here. And so that really came um, uh, up as a second challenge is how do we deal with these variations in water quality and atmospheric conditions? And really the, the main issue here is that the variations in water quality and atmospheric um, conditions, they can shift the zero point of the FDI and NDVI relationship, which then causes misclassifications within the, the model and new scenes. And so just like we saw with the Scottish um, example, this needs to be corrected kind of at a local level around the current pixel we're interested in. We can't just do this blanket for an entire scene. It needs to be kind of a, a moving approach to the, the, um, the, the correction. There's also some other benefits of taking an approach like this, where we're taking a more data-driven approach to correcting the atmospheric um, uh, corrections, um, which is that most existing out-of-the-box atmospheric corrections require some land in the scene to properly calibrate. And eventually we want to be able to apply this to scenes with just open water, so just completely open water. And there we won't be able to use those corrections. So our challenge here was to find a way to do a local normalization of the data that took into account the atmospheric variation and water quality variations in a way that could be used in a lot of different contexts. This is kind of the solution we came up with. So again, it's this kind of moving window um, like approach where for a given pixel that we're interested in classifying, you know, seen here with a star, um, we take a buffered region around that of um, say like 40 meters or so. And we grab all the other pixels that are in that region. Now, um, some of those pixels might contain other debris or might contain say timber or seaweeds, but because of the nature of this problem, the vast majority of them are just gonna be water. Um, and the thing we know about water is that it should have an FDI of zero and an NDVI of zero. 
Um, and so what that allows us to do is just from the raw un atmospheric corrected satellite imagery is we can apply a moving um, average to the scene and calculate what the average FDI and NDVI is. Um, and that signal will mostly be coming from the water. So if we want water to be zero, zero, one thing we can do is normalize our central pixels FDI and NDVI to be um, uh, in line with uh, that a value that would give it um, zero, zero if it was water. So we can basically subtract off this like um, average around the individual pixel. So that was kind of our approach. Um, we implemented it using um, EOLearn again. Um, we implemented this EO task. Um, and basically, the normalized method here is doing most of the work. So what we do is we first mask out any um, areas where there is um, no data from the, the, the um, satellite, or whether there's cloud cover or it's land. So we just get rid of those. And then we use the um, SciPy ND image um, uh, function generic filter to apply this kind of moving average window across the, the scene. And we can use that as either a mean filter, a median filter, or a min filter um, to kind of do this like local normalization. And then we apply that to the MDVI and FD, FDI features um, and also the raw Sentinel bands too, and add them onto the EO patch to be used in the machine learning step. And so what that looks like visually is if we take a region like this, where we can see the NDVI and FDI um, uh, images, we see that in the uncorrected images, there's a large areas of variation within NDVI. So we have this kind of like step function here where it goes from high to low, and then also kind of this variation from top to bottom in the image. Applying this moving window averaging um, approach means we get something that looks like this. And so now we're kind of a much more of a flat field. Um, and this removes the variation in water quality and atmospheric conditions so that each of the pixels can be kind of judged alongside each other um, within the model, which makes the model way more robust to changes in the scene. We can also see this in the FDI and DVI scatter plots. Um, so on the left here, we have the raw uncorrected data. And on the right, we have the corrected data using a median buffer with a uh, 40 meters of um, buffer. And what we see here is in the uncorrected images, our, our pixels go from like minus eight to zero in NDVI for water and like from zero up to like 2.5 for FDI. And those should again really be at zero, zero. So applying this normalization centers our water pixels much closer to zero, zero, and it also helps separate them out from the, the plastic pixels, which gives our, our model a bit better chance of actually identifying the plastics. Training a similar model to what PML trained on this new data and these new values, these normalized FDI and MTVI values, um, we get results like this. So, you know, for most of the classes, we predict them pretty much 100% of the time. There is some confusion between water and debris. We have a precision of about 88% for um, uh, uh, for debris for plastics and a recall of about 42%. So we're we're losing a lot of the plastic um, pixels, but that's okay because again, what we're trying to do here is just discover more plastics, um, so we can build up a larger training data set to me build a more robust model. So we actually will we care about precision way more than we care about recall, and we as, think that as we get more and more data points, this is going to improve and give us a much better um, model as we have more examples of plastic out there. More importantly, however, it, this is like really robust to changes in scenes. So again, looking at this scene from Scotland where the original model was misclassifying a lot of water as spume, locally normalized model correctly identifies those pixels as water, which is great. And then applying this new approach and this new model to um, another region, say for example, in Ghana here, we can see that it's pretty good at picking out likely candidate um, debris candidate pixels um, in this front here, um, also some timber and some seaweeds um, in there. Um, without having a lot of false positives. And so these are kind of candidate pixels that we can go and look at, confirm, and add into our training data set moving forward. So this has been really interesting work. It's been fantastic working with MPML. We think there's a lot of promise for this kind of like locally normalization, local normalization of the data in a data-driven way that could be useful for a lot of different um, domains within satellite imagery, um, machine learning. Um, we are open sourcing everything we've worked on so far. Um, there'll be a link to the GitHub uh, at the end of the talk. Um, we're open sourcing the EO tasks and also the full um, workflow for reproducing all of this. Um, so if it's useful for you, go and check it out and uh, play around with it. Then in next steps, what we're planning to do is use this, as I said before, to kind of try and build up a larger training data set. 
by like predicting pixels that are likely to be plastic or debris and asking um, Lauren and the experts at PML to really confirm whether they are or not, using that to build up this like library of training data to better make to make better models in the future. We want to try new variations in the local normalization model, potentially with other domains and use cases in mind. So if you have one of those, please reach out. And we want to release a generic uh, moving window you'll learn task. So this can be used in other contexts too. And then finally, we really want to get back to our original goal of um, live monitoring of sites where plastic is known to be a problem. So taking this you know, um, learn pipeline and this new local normalization model um, and using it to monitor the plastics in the oceans so we can try and get them out of the ocean, basically. Um, we'd love for you to get in touch. Um, here is a couple of ways you can do that, either through our GitHub um, for the project, our email, or our website. And if you've got a project the Data Clinic could help out with, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much for attending the talk, and I hope you have a great rest of your site. Bye. Thanks.